Well, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you all for joining us today. My name is Stephanie Bachman and I'm the customer experience manager for Fear Free. We are starting a series of fun webinars to break up your stressful week with something to look forward to. These webinars are intended to give you a mental break, learn something new and fun, or cater to your own emotional and mental well-being. I'm excited to introduce our first webinar of the series, At Home Fitness. Exercise is known to improve mental health, relieve stress, help with sleep, and can even boost your overall mood. All webinars that we host will be recorded and live on the Fear Free webinar page for reference at a later time. I am going to request that everybody type their questions in the Q&A section in the bottom bar of your screen in the Zoom webinar window. Questions will be answered or addressed at the conclusion of the webinar. I am pleased to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Evan Anton is Instagram's most followed veterinarian with over 1.3 million followers. Evan went viral after being featured in People Magazine's Sexiest Man Alive issue in 2014 and again in 2016 and 2017. Dubbed the sexiest veterinarian, he took the internet by storm. This summer, Facebook TV show Tusks to Tails with Seeker is dedicated to educating viewers about some of our planet's most unique animals and what wild adaptations they have to contribute to their success. In October this year, Evan will be launching his first book, Worldwide Vet, which covers his life from young wildlife and animal super enthusiast all the way to his veterinary and wildlife conservation work around the world. After animals, fitness has been a lifelong passion for Evan. He's been weight training for over 20 years and was a personal trainer for a year before going to vet school. With no further ado, I welcome Dr. Evan Anton. Hey, you guys. Thank you so much for having me today. Can you guys hear me okay? Awesome, awesome, awesome. So yeah, so many people here. So we are here today. We've got a nice, fun webinar ahead of us. We're going to kind of break it into three sections. We're going to start with just talking about a little bit about my path and, and how I became a veterinarian and why I do what I do and love what I do. Um, and then we're going to do a, uh, we're, we're going to get into the fitness stuff. And I just want to teach you guys some basic kind of at home fitness kind of techniques and that kind of thing. And we'll talk about, I, I just actually, I'm just going to go through basically like a brief um briefly go through like a workout plan and how to do like different muscle groups and divide it amongst different days and we'll talk a little bit more about the fitness side and then if you guys have questions we'll do a little q a so um to kind of discuss about my history basically i've you know always loved animals i grew up in kansas and we had a creek in the backyard and i was always uh, you know, going into the creek and looking for wildlife and looking for, you know, insects and turtles and snakes and just seeing everything I could. And I always knew animals would be a big part of my life. But honestly, it wasn't until college that I realized I wanted to be a veterinarian. So I've got like a cap for my eye, eyebrow. Um, I was, I started as a business major at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And uh, basically, you know, I, I enjoyed it. It was neat, but I wasn't crazy about it. But I had to take some other electives. So I ended up taking Gen Bio, Gen General Biology 1, like an intro to bio kind of course. And then I took another course called Evolutionary Biology. And that was the first point in my life. I just, I just really loved to learn. And I liked learning the subject matter. I liked studying. And this was very new for me. I wasn't that kind of student, honestly, in high school. I was, I was a good student. I did what I had to do to get good grades, but I like to be social with friends and play sports. And I wasn't stoked about going to class and everything. And when I started taking these science courses, I just, I wanted to learn more and I just would look at, you know, into it more and just get so, you know, that much more excited about it, the more I learned. And, and it made so much sense to me too, uh, about the natural world and how things kind of work. Um, so, you know, I, I really reevaluated things and I thought, you know what, I, I've always had an appreciation for medicine and thought it was neat. And for even a second thought, human medicine would be interesting. And then I started, um, you know, just really looking into that a little bit more and realizing for human medicine, you really are just kind of confined to a very specific field, whether it's, you know, surgery or oncology or cardiology or whatever it is, you, you don't, you only kind of just do that. And I really liked, you know, all the different facets of medicine. I wanted to do some surgery. I wanted to work with different animals. I wanted to do, you know, behavior stuff and you know, there's so many different things you can do as a practicing veterinarian, let alone as, you know, in the veterinary profession, there's all kinds of things you can do outside the hospital too. But anyways, I love that variety. I love animals, knew they'd be a huge part of my life professionally or personally, if not professionally as well. And thought, you know what, 
being a vet makes the most sense for me. And so um, when I was finishing up my first year of undergrad, I changed majors to evolutionary and ecological biology and literally did everything I could to get into vet school, which at that time was very challenging. I don't think it's as competitive as it used to be these days, uh, which sounds funny for me to say, but it's, you know, what that was, I got, I started applying in 2008. Yeah, I mean, over 10 years ago, it was much more competitive. It was like, I think my school was accepting around 10% or maybe a little bit less of the students applying. So I had to have a good application. So anyways, I was spending time at wildlife rescues um, locally and getting experience working with wildlife. I was volunteering with veterinarians locally. Um, I was getting myself involved with some of the research going on at CU, uh, CU and that was with, um, that was in the reptile department. I'm a big reptile guy. That's kind of, reptiles got me first excited about animals in general as a small child. I love crocodiles and venomous snakes and dinosaurs and all kinds of stuff. Anyway, so I was doing some research with um, snake constriction in a, uh, speci in a garter snake species and comparing it to some other colubrids or non-venomous um, snakes that are, that are native to North America and stuff. Um, and in, at this point, when I made that decision, I also realized, you know what, nothing's stopping me from traveling the world and seeing some of my favorite wildlife in person in their native habitats. And so the first time I did a big trip, I went to Australia and I did a study abroad semester based in Sydney and lived there for six months, traveled all over that country, up and down the East Coast, the West Coast, the top end, the dead center, the South, just all over. And I was in New Zealand for a month too, doing some traveling, but just had an amazing time, you know, looking for Australian native wildlife, looking for crocodiles and monitors and snakes and all their cool marsupials. And that was back in 2006. The next year I went to Tanzania for another semester abroad. I'm very lucky I got to do those things. And for those of you students that are interested in doing something like that, um, I highly encourage it. Honestly, I can't recommend it more. It's, it's, um, it's, a uh, you know, it's, 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 they're often a little bit more expensive. There are a lot of scholarships and I got a lot of help from scholarships and things like that to help me pursue these semesters abroad. But man, the, the, the cultural things you can learn, especially from Tanzania, Australia is a bit more like America than Tanzania, I guess. Um, and the perspectives you can gain and just, you know, getting your wherewithal uh, in, in functioning in a totally different country is, is, I think, you know, I think it's priceless. I think there's so much value to that. And then getting to explore and travel and, you know, you can find yourself a little bit and, and just learn a lot about yourself and, and new places and come home with a completely different perspective because you've seen these other parts of the world and how it works. And it's in, you know, many cases very different than what we're used to. So that's another side note. Um, yeah, no, I, I mean, really for every, at least once a year thereafter, I would save up just enough money and have, you know, just enough time between semesters to travel somewhere exotic. Um, whether it was Central America, South America, um, Southeast Asia, I went there a few times, different places and, you know, trying to just get in these wild habitats and also get with veterinarians, get with wildlife rescues if I could and reach out to them and just kind of take it from there. And, and um, you know, it was all super worthwhile and super fun. And that was just me pursuing my passion and loving it. And I was really lucky I got into uh, Colorado State and, and, and it started there in 2009. And I, was, I really wanted to do in-state. So this is another little tip I have for any of you guys that are considering or wanting to pursue veterinary school. And that is, um, I think honestly these days, my number one recommendation is to just get in-state tuition. There's not that many vet schools. There's more than there was 10 years ago, but I, I don't think there's much more than 35 or 36 vet schools, maybe a little more. Um, you're gonna get a good education really at any of them. Some of them are a little bit better for, you know, maybe equine medicine or, 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 or swine, you know, pig medicine or chicken or exotics or whatever it is. Um, but honestly, you, that's not going to make or break who you are as a veterinarian. And unless you have somebody funding your veterinary school education, um, you're going to be taking out loans. You're going to be in debt. You're going into a career that has a very poor debt to income ratio. And if you can get a good education anywhere, which we're so lucky that we can, being in North America uh, and in the US, you know, I'd say just get in state. You are gonna save so much money and have so much less debt to pay off. Where, you know, some kids these days are going to private schools and they're in debt well over $300,000. Um, with a veterinary career, unless you own 
of maybe a few hospitals or you're specialized and you are bringing in some decent money, you know, I don't know if and how you're ever going to pay it off. It's going to, it will take your whole professional career and then some, I think, to pay off something like that, unless again, you have some other kind of help or some other business or something. So yeah, in-state tuition, number one. Um, Vet school itself is uh, challenging for most people. I'm no exception. I'm not, you know, I, I, I'm capable of getting good grades and getting by in school, but I have to put the work and I have to put the time in and I have to study a lot. So for me, vet school is all about making a lot of sacrifices. And when my friends were doing big trips to get together to go, you know, camping or hiking or go to Vegas or whatever it was, I had to pass on a lot of those. And I really had to just buckle down and stay focused on school. I was really lucky that, you know, with my loans, my parents helped me a little bit in vet school, which definitely helped some. I didn't have to work. I didn't have kids to take care of or anything like that. So I didn't have those other uh, responsibilities that can make it even more challenging. I was really able to focus on my education. And I'm really thankful for that because, uh, you know, I went to CSU and I feel like I got a really strong education there. Um, and CSU, that's Colorado State University, which is in Fort Collins. And I grew up in Kansas, but when I moved to Colorado, I got in-state tuition or became an in-state resident after my first year of undergrad. And so that from that point on, I was in-state. Um, and then I went to vet school. Yeah, and that was intense. It was four years. It was, it was every emotion you can imagine. It was stressful. It was scary. It was really difficult. It was fun. It was exciting. It was an adventure. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't want to do it again now, but I'm you know, so glad I did it. And I think it's, um, like I said, I think most vet schools in North America are going to, are going to provide you with an awesome education. Um, I knew I wanted to work with small animals and exotics. So a lot of vet schools these days offer uh, tracking is what they call it. And it's where you can track either small animal or large animal. And maybe they have other tracks these days too. Maybe you can track more even defined specialized kinds of veterinary, uh, you know, um, you know uh, care. But at CSU, they had general, which was kind of like your general st standard uh, vet school education course. Uh, and then you had small animal, and then you had large animal. And for those of you guys that don't know, just FYI, small animal in, in very basic terms means like dog, cat kind of vet practice. Large animal means, um, you know, equine, you know, horses, bovine, cows, you know, goats, pigs, sheep and you know whatever else a lot of large animal vets are mobile and so they go to where the animals are because it's it's pretty logistically complicated uh to get animals to the vet it's possible no doubt they do it all the time but it's a lot more baggage than just throwing your cat or dog in the car and going for a little ride um so i did small animal knew i wanted to do exotics i did every exotic elective course that i could so i everything you know even in uh before we were in in, in um in clinical rotations, where we're actually doing hands-on stuff with animals, even in the classroom, I'm taking every reptile, fish, uh, small mammal, bird, every kind of topic I can there. When we finally did get to clinical rotations, where we're actually in uh, in a in a clinical situation where we usually have one or two clinicians, um, uh, one or two or three residents, and then one or two or three interns uh, on each rotation, and then probably seven to nine or 10 vet students per rotation. At CSU, every school might be a little different. Anyways, I did our exotics rotation probably more than anybody has ever at CSU, unless, you know, I don't know, but I did it like five times. Most people, if anything, do it maybe once. But over those two clinical years, the third and fourth year, I did it like five times. And then I did externships at, um, at places that work with exotics. And so I did one at the San Antonio Zoo under Dr. Rob Koch, he's amazing and super sharp vet. I think he's double boarded. I think he's got a reptile and a zoo um, boarded certification. So that's, that's, that means he's done a residency and done a very in-depth education uh, with, with reptile medicine and zoo medicine. Super sharp vet, good guy. And then I did a, um, another externship at the Arizona Exotic Animal Hospital under Dr. Jay Johnson, also another very sharp uh, exotics vet, great with reptiles. He's like the tortoise guru. And um, I got, got, you know, got a lot of really great experiences at places like that. And then um, in my fourth year of vet school, my goal was, uh, you know, I, I originally wanted to practice in Colorado, but at that point, I, I actually wanted to move to California. And so my fourth year, 
I took two trips to California and, and prior to doing so, I reached out to like pretty much every exotic, big exotic veterinary hospital I could find in uh, the LA area and then the San Diego area. Those were the two cities I was kind of looking at. And my motivation for that was number one, get to know what my colleagues were, you know, get to know my colleagues in the area and just, you know, have a relationship with them. The vet world is a small world. And so I knew there was value to at least, you know, meeting some of these guys and gals and just seeing what practice is like there. Uh, my other goal was to maybe land a job. And so to every one of these, I was bringing a resume and I was shadowing them for anywhere from a half a day to two days uh, per hospital and spending time with them and seeing patients and just, you know, trying to get my foot in the door uh, at all these different places. And it super paid off. I had a great uh, time that I you know, spent with Conejo Valley Vet Hospital. I met the practice manager at the time. Uh, I met a bit of the staff, hung out for a bit, and I really liked it because this is another tip for vet students that are in vet school and looking for work. And, and I'm, this probably isn't the first time you've heard it, but I think one of the most valuable things you can do when you find a job after work, if you're going to clinical practice, is to find a hospital that is kind of a bigger hospital and that has multiple vets and they're willing to mentor you to some degree, at least. Uh, but at least having multiple vets, just so you can, if there are some challenging cases that you would like a little bit of help on and bounce some ideas off of and have, you know, some of your colleagues maybe look at some x-rays or just tell them about some complicated medicine case. Or even if you're in the operating room and you're doing a surgery, then it's maybe one of the first times you've done it. And it's a little bit intimidating and it's just nice to have some back if you need it with an experienced veterinarian that's probably done it many more times. Um, that kind of Mentorship and guidance and assistance is absolutely priceless, and I cannot recommend it higher. So that was super important to me. When I came to Conejo Valley Vet Hospital, there were 11 vets working there. That's a lot. That's way more than even most big vet practices. I mean, I think people consider a vet practice to be on the bigger side if they have even four or five or six plus vets. So that was really exciting for me. They saw a lot of exotics. They have a deep history in seeing exotics and wildlife and, um, and even like Hollywood kind of animals from the 60s and 70s and 80s. So that was super cool to me. Then they've worked with, you know, big cats and primates and all kinds of super neat animals. Uh, so I knew this was a really good fit for me. I super hit it off with my boss. He's like, he's like uh, you know, we have so much in common. He loves to travel. He loves wildlife. He's a killer exotics vet. He's a great surgeon. and um, we just totally hit it off from the first interview. And so I was really lucky I got the job. I got, he actually offered me kind of a short form mentorship program that could lead into a full associate kind of contract. And so basically the first three months I was doing a mentorship kind of thing with him. And I was like, he was like my mentor and I was bouncing off cases off him every day that I was in the hospital. And I, I was, I'm very thankful for it. And it was very helpful. And I learned a lot just getting to work under him a bit. And then I actually uh, traveled for three months. I went to Indonesia three months after graduating. So I worked for three months, traveled for three months, and then basically I uh, just got out in the wild. I went to a couple wildlife, excuse me, sorry guys, went to a couple wildlife rescues, uh, learned, learned a lot there, got to look for wildlife in the wild. I got to dive, I got to see Komodo dragons, I got to you know, look for you know, my, some of my favorite pit vipers and snakes and cobras. I caught my first spinning cobra in Komodo as well. Saw some of the coolest primates in the world, including orangutans, which are one of the most beautiful special apes, uh, greater apes. I saw lesser apes like gibbons. I saw proboscis monkeys, tons of macaques. I saw tarsiers, one of the smallest primates, tons of birds. So anyways, I can go off forever about Indonesia. But um, yeah, from there on, I just, you know, every kind of the same kind of thing. When I could get enough time off and save up enough money to do an exotic trip, I would have probably, you know, about once a year at that point. Uh, my career and life and opportunities changed a lot when some of the things happened that Stephanie mentioned earlier about like, you know, just being in magazines and going viral on social media. And now my life is, it's so different because back when I used to reach out to all these organizations, hoping they would let a pre-vet or vet student or veterinarian in the door just to hang out and help out and volunteer. And I would be so lucky when that would happen. These days I have organizations like that reaching out to me, seeing if I'll come um, help them with their work, meet some of their vets or conservationists or whatever, because of the value that I can bring to them with, with getting their, um, their work out, you know, in the public uh, in an effective way because of my outreach and ability to do so. And it's just been the most fortunate blessing. Uh, you know, one of the biggest blessings of my life has been, honestly, 
uh, some of those things like the, the, you know, going viral and whatnot, because it's landed me so many cool opportunities. And, and we'll talk about some more of those with the Q and A. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of my story in a bit of a nutshell. It's 423. So I think honestly, it'd be super fun to get into the workout stuff. Stephanie, are you there? Yes, I am. Hi, is there anything else that we should chat about? Because I know Dr. Marty, who is a good friend of mine and just an awesome colleague, and I'm so thankful and he's such a big ambassador of this profession. So it's super cool to see what he's done with his career and fear free. But he mentioned that, you know, talking, he had a few talking points or some questions he wanted to ask. I'm, is there anything else that, that you think would be nice to talk about that these guys would like to hear about before we get into the fitness stuff? And I have plenty of time if we go, we can go over an hour, it's fine with me, we can do whatever, but well, I just want to, you know, make sure that we're getting everything you guys had in mind. Oh, yeah. No, I think that was a, a really good covering everything. And whatever questions people have, we'll address those at the end. So. Okay, perfect. Perfect. Okay. So now you guys, I want to talk a little bit about fitness. Um, I would say this is one of the other big passions of my life. I've been interested in weight training and physical fitness and nutrition for you know, almost as long as I've been into animals. I mean, that's really, it's like a second passion. If I wasn't a vet, I think my professional career would be involved in fitness. Um, I was actually, I was a personal trainer for a year before vet school. Uh, I knew I was going to vet school and applying and wanting to be in vet school, but I, uh, I, you know, I love that, that side of things. And I just wanted to explore it a little bit more and get some training certifications and work with people on that level. And it was a really fun, fun job because you're, it's such a positive thing, which is, often the case at the vet hospital, but often not, you know, we have to do things that can be really sad and intense and heavy and it can be kind of a different experience. Whereas when you're a trainer, people are paying to hang out with you and get fit. And it's, um, it's something that you can make a really enjoyable thing. Um, when it comes to fitness, there are many different approaches. There's many different ways to be fit and healthy, whether it's hiking and being outdoors or pursuing hobbies that keep you active or doing, you know, cardio kind of based exercising or doing weight training. I personally, uh, I don't, I'm not going to say weight training is better than any of those necessarily, but for me, weight training has brought me so much joy and so much value to my life because I love it. I love that you can physically change your body. I was so fascinated by that when I was younger and I had a, I was, I've been a lifelong Arnold Schwarzenegger, uh, mega fan. I love his work. I love his mentality. I love his you know, his, his whole thing on having a vision and pursuing it. You know, he wanted to be the number one bodybuilder, the number one, uh, you know, action hero in Hollywood, the, the governor of California. He, he has a vision and he goes for it and he knows exactly what he has to do to get there. And he, he executes and he does it. So I have a ton of respect for him. And when I, when I saw that kind of work ethic and saw how it could be applied to fitness and weight training, I just fell in love. And I've been weight training for over 20 years uh, on and off. And, uh, you know, I try to be consistent, but sometimes it's tough when I travel, but I think it brings me a lot of physical health benefits for obvious reasons. I think it brings me emotional stability and emotional health uh, more than anything. And I feel like my mood is, is stable. Not that I'm unstable, but, you know, I feel just generally happier and healthier and better when I am exercising on a regular basis. So, even if you're not trying to do competitive bodybuilding where you're going to go step on a stage and flex and pose, you know, and, and compete against other people and you're just doing it for your own reasons, which is why I do it. Um, you, there's just so much value to it emotionally and physically and mentally. And just, it's so good for you to exert yourself and put your body through that stress and that strain. It, what it does for you hormonally and how it works with your endocrine system and, and just releasing endorphins and putting your body through the stressors it really helps you just cope with everything day to day, physically and emotionally, so much more effectively. So that's super, super important. For a lot of people, when I was a trainer, I would talk about weight training also in terms of their fitness goals, which I would say 90% of the time were weight loss. I definitely had some clients that just wanted to put on muscle or they had, you know, they were competitive athletes and they had, you know, certain goals when it came to that. But I would say 90% of my clients they wanted to lose weight and put on some muscle. And so a lot of my female clients in particular were always concerned about putting on too much muscle and getting too bulky and too big. And I tell you, that's possible, but it's super rare. And unless you have a genetic predisposition to put on, um, you know, kind of extreme amounts of muscle in a really, you know, fast time frame and really easily with low resistance, 
it's really not a concern for, for really anybody. It takes a lot of work to get too bulky for most people. And so the benefits to putting, to focusing more on muscle and weight training than cardio, if you're going to spend some time, and I, I think it's great to do both. I'm not hating on cardio. Cardio is great. It can only get you so far though. Once your body's used to it, you're not going to put on a whole lot more muscle or change your body composition that much more. And, you know, with, especially in terms of the muscle, you know, you'll just, you know, you might lose some fat and burn calories and everything. But when you have more muscle in your body, you have a higher resting metabolic rate. So even when you're vegging and you're sitting on the couch and just eating and watching TV, your metabolism is running at a faster rate. Your engine requires more fuel. Okay. And so you can get away with eating more in the day and your body wants more and you're maintaining your just your homeostasis just elevated a little bit where you don't have to be so strict with your diet because you just have more fuel going into that fire because of the muscle that you're trying to maintain and the muscle that you're working with. And honestly, when you put on some muscle there, it just brings everything together. It can help with posture, it can help with uh, the proportions of your body, it can help you, you know, hit a lot of those fitness goals that a lot of people um, have when it comes to cosmetic, aesthetic uh, fitness goals, which I think, you know, just being blunt, I think that's the reason that 95, maybe 99% of people exercise. It's because they want to look a certain way. It's not because they're competitive athletes or, you know, whatever other reason, you know, maybe for some people it's for their health and it's for their heart health or whatever it is, or they're, you know, they are overweight and they have other issues they're trying to combat, whether it's diabetes or whatnot. But I'd say most people, they just want to look a certain way. And so there's nothing wrong with that. That is, that's one of my motivations exercising too. So I've put together a, uh, a workout plan. It's resistance-based training. And so I just, I have it on my phone. That's why I'm just going to be referencing this. Um, you'll see me just kind of looking at my phone here. And I just want to go through it with you. I created this, um, this workout plan, actually a similar plan to my mom, for my mom, because she doesn't have a lot of at home fitness kind of stuff to her availability. And she wants to be able to work out at home. And this was even before the pandemic, but this was, you know, there's some days she can't get to the gym and do the things she wants to do. So I wanted to have something for her that was effective and, um, and, and something she could do on a regular basis and easily do from home. Okay, so what we're gonna do, it's gonna involve a little bit of furniture and it's going to involve a couple of dumbbells and a couple of bands. I don't have my bands at the moment, so I will make a mention to when bands can be of value. But really, if you can get a couple of different weights of dumbbells, which is, you know, it's a, it's a small investment, but it's a really does not cost much. I mean, with the cost of one or two months of a gym membership, you can get a sufficient number of dumbbells just to get started. And so maybe like an eight pound, a 10 pound, a 15 pound, a 20 pound, something like that. Get like three or four different weights within that range. And you can do so much with those and your own body weight and a little bit of furniture. And so we're going to talk about how we're going to do that today. So I think I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to warn you guys now. This is my first um, fitness seminar, webinar kind of thing ever that I've ever done. You know, like I said, I was a trainer. I used to do this in person all the time, but that, that, was, at a, that was at a full functioning, you know, big gym. And so now we're going to be doing this at home. I'm going to try to do this in my living room. I've got a little home gym room too. And um, I just don't know if the lighting and the size is going to be appropriate. So if you guys can be, just be patient with me, we will, uh, we will get through this. And I'm going to try to set up right here. So just give me a second and hang tight. We're going to be facing my couch in my living room. And I'll set you back a little bit. Just moving my coffee table. Okay, thank you guys for your patience, sorry. Let me just get you elevated a little bit. Grabbing a little stool. I've got my chair. All right. And so if you guys have questions along the way, please um, save those and, and let me know in our Q&A section. We'll try to get through a bit of those. I'm just putting some pillows here. Sorry, I messed with this yesterday. I think this will work. Okay. So are we far enough away? Yeah. I think, I 
think we can get away with this. None of my rooms are super, super big, so it's, it's tough to, uh, to make the space that we need. I'm just going to move here a little bit here. I've got my workout buddy. This is Henry. For those of you who don't know, Henry is my dog. I adopted him from Boulder Humane Society about 10, sorry, 12 years ago. Okay, so let's go through this. Today we're going to start with arms. And what I've done is I've broken this up into a routine of different, a split muscle group routine, which I would say is the most common form of a consistent training, uh, weight training, uh, split muscle group kind of routine that most people that do weight training are doing. And so they sometimes divide it upper body, lower body. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide it into kind of more specific muscle groups. Okay, so we're going to do arms, then we're going to do chest and the front of your shoulders, then we're going to do back your back and then the, your rear deltoid or the back of your shoulders, and then we're gonna do legs. And then you can throw in some core and abdominals and those kind of things too at the end of any of these days. But um, we're just gonna go through each of these and that will give you four days that you can do. If you can commit four days, that would be great. If you need to combine a couple of these days because you can only do three days a week, that can still go very far too. But this is a great way to at least start and have some basic resistance training. So hang tight, I'm gonna grab a couple sets of dumbbells. And then I've got this chair we might be using it a bit too. And then Henry's going to be hanging out with us uh, as well. Hi, Henry. Are you going to work out? Do a little, little training sesh? You going to spot me? See? He's already excited. All right, you guys hang tight. I'll be right back. All right, so we got some basic dumbbells. I got these for my fiance a couple years ago. They're effective. We got 10 pounds and we've got 15 pounds. So this is something you kind of have to decide on your own what you're going to be doing uh, weight wise. But I think, you know, weights like this are a fine place for most people to start. So like I said, get five, tens, 15s, eight, tens, 12s, whatever. Something like that's going to be fine. Okay, arms. I have a starting with what's called standing dumbbell curls. And so these are pretty, pretty standard exercise to do. You could technically do these seating and I might just do them seating just so you guys can see me a little bit better. But the key when you're doing curls is you want, whether you're sitting or you're standing, you want your back straight and your chest out a little bit. So if on a profile view, I'm kind of like this, or I'm trying to like, you know, good straight posture, chest out, and I even tilt forward a little bit at my hips and I'll keep my feet close together. And then you're just taking these weights and the key is the only joint moving is your elbow joint. Your shoulders are not moving. They're not coming up like this or coming back like this. Your wrists aren't doing a whole lot. Your body's not doing a lot at the hips. You're just isolating this muscle group right here. That's really, really it. And so if I was doing these curls, I'll get a little bit of an angle for you. You're literally just right here and coming up and a full contraction. And you can rotate your wrists a little bit on the way up or down, but you just wanna come all the way up and give a nice squeeze up top. And this is kind of the same mentality for any of the movements we're gonna do. So like I said, you can do seated or you can do standing, whatever works for you. I'm only seating because of my, my uh, how, much, how much of a range of view we can get here. So those I have you doing standing dumbbell curls four, uh, four, four, three or four sets of 10 to 12 reps. That's it. The next one is called a laying floor skull crusher. And so basically you're laying on the floor. I'll just do it on the couch here just so you guys can see it. Okay. But you're, you're doing, we call these skull crushers. It's basically a dumbbell or barbell tricep extension. The same thoughts apply in that you want to isolate everything but the elbow joint in this movement. Any movement you're doing, and I'll, I'm sure I'll keep saying this, anytime you're doing any movement, Think about what you're doing. That mind-muscle connection is the key to effective resistance training. And so if you're trying to work your tricep, think about what does the tricep do? The tricep extends the arm. That's what it does. This is your tricep, right? So I don't want to do anything with my shoulder. I don't want to do anything with my body. All I want to do is just extend that arm. So we're simply using gravity. And I'm going to move this chair just a little bit. We're using gravity and we're just stabilizing. 
We're laying back on our back, holding the dumbbells over our head, and literally just dropping them just like this. Notice my elbows aren't moving. I'm just, my shoulder, I'm sorry, my elbows are moving. My shoulders aren't moving. Only my elbows are coming down, and the weight is coming down right next to my head, and then I'm fully extending it and activating my triceps. And that's it, and a nice big squeeze up top, really hit that muscle. So this arm day, we're kind of just alternating biceps and triceps. So those ones you're gonna be doing, um, I had my mom doing four sets also of 10 to 12 reps. I think if you can, if you have the time to get through four sets, I think it's great. If you need to start with three, if these are new movements for you and you're putting your body through these stresses and it's very, very new, maybe one or two sets the first time you go through this cycle is okay. That's totally fine, just to get used to the movements. But um, ideally, if you can get up to three or four sets, that's great. Okay, bent over or seated dumbbell Arnold curls. So these are, this is a classic, people call these Arnold curls or thinking man curls. Basically, we're just hitting the bicep a little bit differently. These ones I actually do sit for. I'm gonna tilt you guys down just a tiny bit. And so here, what you're doing is, let's grab my dumbbell. Um, also, just isolating the elbow. You guys can't see my arm there, I'm sorry. It's unique workout. I gotta get my home gym squared away. You're putting the back of your lower arm against your leg just to stabilize it. Your hands extended down, you have the dumbbell, you're isolating everything but the elbow and you're just coming up. What I try to do is I try to pretend I'm, I'm basically like taking my pinky knuckle here and touching it to the inside of my shoulder. Okay, so you're just literally just like this, right to the shoulder. That's it. And then repping and doing both arms. But notice the only thing moving is my elbow. Big squeeze up top, activate your bicep. That's really it. So then we go back to a, um, a tricep movement. And for those, we're gonna do kickbacks. Okay, so dumbbell kickbacks. So with kickbacks, you can do these a number of ways. You don't have to, you can do it with a band, you can stand, you can be on a chair, you can be on your knees, you can do whatever you want. Um, a lot of times when I do these, I'm like bent over a bench. So I'm just gonna show you guys one way of doing them. Again, I've said this every single movement we've done, you're just isolating a muscle group. So I'm just gonna go like this, I'm gonna lean on a chair, I'm gonna get my upper arm parallel to the ground, and it's gonna stay parallel to the ground the whole time, and then my elbow is gonna move, and that's the kickback. That's why it's called a kickback. So it's literally just the elbow coming back here. So it's the same thing with the dumbbell. Just kicking back, full extension. And these are tough, they're humbling. You're not gonna do as much weight as you think probably, but you're just kind of bringing it back there, getting a full nice activation of the tricep and, uh, and doing each arm. And so I'm getting a little workout in. So you're doing, again, if you can do three or four sets, 10, 12 reps. That's kind of the thing with all of these. I don't wanna keep, you know, I, I wanna keep things as simple as possible. I don't wanna make anything any more complicated than it has to be. And so for everything we're going through, you guys, just consider it three to four sets of 10 to 12 reps for now. We can modify that as time goes on, as you're training, that can change without a doubt, but that's a great, safe, good place to start where you can get totally effective workouts doing these number of sets. And to be honest, these, I've, like I said, I've been lifting for 20 years. I still generally do four sets of everything, and I generally do you know, 10 to 12 reps, give or take. Some sets a little more, some sets a little less. Um, the next thing I had was a standing dumbbell hammer curl. And so the hammer curls are just working a little bit different part of the arm. We're getting a little bit more of the extensor uh, muscle groups. We're hitting a little bit more of the brachialis next to the bicep, but really I'm gonna do it sitting down like we were doing the other ones. And all you're doing here that's different is you're rotating the wrist so your wrist looks like, kind of like a hammer. Everything else is the same, back straight, chest out. All your other uh, joints are, you know, nothing's moving, just the elbow, and you're just coming up like this. Just like that. So you just look like a hammer. See this? That's it, just the elbow moving. A nice big squeeze up top, good posture, chest out. You can tilt forward to the hips a little bit. You want your upper arm perpendicular to the ground from shoulder to elbow. It's like a flagpole right out of the ground and just that arm's coming right up, and you're focusing on your kind of lateral bicep, brachialis, and a little bit of these muscles too. 
Okay. And then the last tricep one, so it's three buys and three tries. The last tricep one is uh, a standing uh, dumbbell overhead tricep extension. So for these, again, isolating everything, grabbing a dumbbell. So your arms also like a flagpole, just opposite orientation. You're just extending up this way. That's it. Both arms, three to four sets. So that's arms. I'll leave core out. I'll let you guys decide what core you want to do, whether it's crunches or whatnot. But just for the sake of time, we'll just move forward here. Chest slash front shoulders. Push-ups. You guys probably know push-ups. Um, I'll do a couple just to show you. But the key with push-ups is keeping your body pretty much straight and making sure it doesn't move. Don't dump your hips down. Um, you know, try to get a full range of motion. We're going almost nearly to the floor. I'd rather you get a bigger range of motion than um, have to sacrifice how deep you go by staying on, on your toes instead of your knees. If you can't get the full range of motion on your toes, go to your knees. There's plenty of times I'm training where I am wrapping up with push-ups and I can only do so more where I'm on, on my toes. And so like a standard one's kind of like that, pretty typical, pretty basic. If I'm getting tired, I'll just drop to my knees. Keeping the same kind of range of motion, same form, nice and deep, wide hands, chest to the floor, right back up. That's the first chest movement. And then we have incline push-ups. Okay, so incline push-ups are basically, what you're doing is you're effectively trying to do an incline chest press. So instead of a normal bench where you're kind of pushing out this way, an incline is kind of like this. So you're trying to actually hit your upper chest a little bit more, which a lot of people don't hit enough. In the weight training world, we call it like the top shelf. So they got like a, you know, some pec muscle development down here, but they don't have anything up here. You want to have up here too for that well-rounded, and it's also very good for your shoulders. And it's a good, it's a good motion to include in here. And I'd say in any weight training split muscle group routine, you're hitting incline. It's just part of the part of the fun. So for this, I'm just elevating my feet. You can elevate your knees if the feet's too hard. You don't have to do this at all if it's too hard in general. It's a little bit more challenging, but it's really just like a push-up, but your feet are just up a little bit. And so for this, you can do it where you, know, you put your feet up on a chair. That's totally fine. Same kind of thing. Nice wide stance, all the way down, chest to the floor, right back up. All right, so three or four sets of those. And then the next one, all right, decline, couch dips. Yeah, these, or you can do on a chair. So I'll start repositioning you guys a little bit. For the decline dips, you want to get on something that's stable and can hold your weight when you're basically putting just your arms on something and the rest of you is kind of in front of it. So I'm going to try this chair. I've not done dips on this chair before. But a lot of people do it on chairs. So you're just like this. I'm going to scoot back and tilt down a little bit just so you can see a little bit more of me. And for these, since we're hitting chest, I'll lean forward just a little bit, just to hit a little bit more of the chest. And the same kind of thing. You're just, you should feel it in your lower, your lower chest area. Feet staying together. And your elbows can go wide on this. When you're, when you're looking at it from a, from a head on, you can go kind of wide to hit it. If you're more narrow like this, it's a little bit more tricep. We've already done tricep. So I want to go a little bit uh, wide and get a little bit more of that chest involved in that motion. Um, Okay, then we're hitting some of the front shoulders. So standing dumbbell overhead shoulder press. You can also do this sitting. An overhead shoulder press is like what it sounds like. It's, you know, you've maybe seen a military press where you grab a barbell and you're pressing like this. I just have dumbbell shoulder press because dumbbells are much easier to acquire and store at home compared to a big, you know, seven foot, whatever, 45 pound Olympic bar. Um, and so basically you can do these standing or sitting. I'm gonna sit just for the sake of our our view here. Here, Henry. Here, Henry. Good boy. So with these, the key is, again, just sitting up straight. This goes for really any motion. You're trying to sit up straight. Your arms are right about here, kind of parallel, like your hands would be kind of where your ears are. Your, your back's uh, straight, your chest is out a little bit. You're just pressing that right over your head, just like that. And just a nice clean motion. Try to keep your forearms parallel the whole time. So they're not going out here, out here, or in here. They're just kind of here. And so they do come closer together towards the end. But it's kind of that motion. That's going to hit a lot of that front deltoid. 
So drop a few sets of that, and then we'll do um, standing lateral shoulder raises. Okay. So for these, also sitting is fine. And grab these little guys for the raises. All we're doing here, again, chest out, back straight, all the same stuff. Your body's nice and stagnant, so you can focus on the muscle group you're hitting. You're not moving your core, doing anything else. We're trying to do a motion. You're not doing this kind of thing or whatever. You're just nice and straight. And the only thing, the only joint moving is your shoulder, not your elbow, not your wrist, not your back, not your hips, not nothing else. You're just coming up just to the side like this. And I like to come just past parallel from the ground. Really hit that middle and front delt really, really well. Right there. And you're just kind of coming up literally right to your side. The next one is just a front raise also called these sagittal raises. So you're going in that sagittal plane, which is this way. So it's the same thing. All this, excuse me, all the same factors. And you're just coming up like this, just like this. If you can knock out three to four sets of that's great. Back straight, chest out, shoulders the only thing moving. Same thing. Now, my muscle is so key when it comes to weight training. Really try to focus on what you're doing. Think about why am I doing this movement? What am I trying to hit? and what does not need to be involved. And when you're doing a shoulder movement, especially a focused one like that, we're doing a side or a front raise, nothing else needs to be involved. Okay, back. Back's a little bit more challenging to do at home. Um, I personally like to do pull-ups, things like that. If you have the strength for it, they're a little bit more challenging. A lot of people can't do pull-ups, so I totally get it. Um, for my mom, she can't do a whole lot of pull-ups. So she's strong, she's fit, she's in shape, and I'm super proud of her, but she's not, she can't rep out pull-ups, you know? Um, so I start with like bent over dumbbell rows. With these, I like to add a band. Okay, so what I'll, I had her do is we grab the dumbbells. And a row, by the way, just FYI, rowing motions, anytime you're pulling a weight towards you. It could be from here, from here, from here, from here. You're just pulling up a weight towards you. It's a common back exercise. You're hitting some of your lats. You're hitting some of your rhomboids or kind of the muscles going down the middle of your back there. And for these, I would just do a bent over. So you're kind of squatting over a little bit. You are basically, I like to have my feet together, um, bend of the knees, bend of the hip, tilt, tilt over. If you can get your back almost flat and you're parallel to the ground, great. If it's a little bit up, that's fine too. And you're just pulling that weight up right about here, like right if it was going to be across your chest in terms of like um, where it is from front to back. And then I'll show you a front view. Your elbows can go a little bit back into the side, kind of like this. And you're just trying to squeeze that back as you come up. A nice stretch as you come down. Squeeze you come up. I had my mom do bands with that because where your feet are and where the dumbbells are, you could easily put bands right here, right under your feet, and have like a nice strap to add resistance as you're getting higher and higher up. It's going to give you more, <clears throat> more resistance there. Okay, the next one is a, uh, a lying. I had, a band, I had her doing band pullovers. Those are a little complicated. I'd say you can do just a lying one. So if you can find some kind of bench or something, I, my computer's on what I would probably use for this. But with the pullover, basically what you're doing is you're laying on your back. The, your upper back is supported by something. You have dumbbells in your hands and you're just doing, you're starting from here and pulling up this way. It actually hits a little bit of your chest too, but it is like a classic kind of back move because it's your lat your lat, your latissimus dorsi, your lat muscle is activating to bring your elbow from here to here. That's a lot of back, a lot of lat doing that. So I'll grab a dumbbell. I'll let Henry help me out here. Come here, buddy. I'll just lay on my back like this. Pull the dumbbell over my head. My back's nice and stable and flat. My arms are staying straight. I bring the weight to just kind of the, the height of my head and then right back up here. And you'll feel it in your chest your lower chest, your, your outer and lower chest, and your back. And you want those lats activated. Those big, the wings, the big back muscles there. Arguably, I mean, they're one of the biggest muscle groups, maybe second to the glutes in the body. They're a very big muscle. Um, seated band rows. So yeah, we did the bent over bar rows. When I did seated band rows with her, basically, I had her put the band around a really stable uh, column in her house. And so she was wrapping it around this like vertical column and grabbing the band on both sides and she was sitting and doing it. So I don't have a column or, the or that to show you, but basically what she's doing is 
sitting on the floor, feet up like this, the band's around the column, and she's just doing a row like this. So again, your posture is nice, your back's straight, your chest is out a little bit. You can lean back a little bit, but you don't need to lean back so much. A good stretch on the way forward, and really pulling back on the way back, you're trying to pull your chest to your shoulders, you're really going past your chest, and you're trying to activate basically down the middle of your back. And I don't have a diagram, but hopefully that makes sense. So those are good. And those are basically just like a seated kind of row. So you probably see machines where you have like a cable and a stack and you put your feet up on the things and you're sitting on a flat bench and you're pulling like this. That's meant to basically mimic that. Um, bent over. Yeah, and the last thing for, for the back rear delt, because some of those rows and things hit the, your rear deltoid or the back of your shoulder, basically this area, kind of that kind of motion. And so what you're doing for these is I like to do these seated. And I do, even if I'm at the gym, I do these really the same exact way. I'll grab a couple dumbbells and I'll sit, I'm gonna tilt you guys up just a little bit. I'll sit forward, lean forward like this, trying to keep your back pretty straight. Dumbbells kind of meet under your legs. Your elbows, what's key here is your elbows are facing out like to your sides at the beginning of the motion. And as your arm comes up, they end up facing up. But when you're doing this, this motion right here, you're hitting the, uh, your rear deltoid very effectively coming up just like that. So I'm gonna tilt you just so you can see the front view as well. Same kind of thing. I'm not gonna do my left one because I'm gonna bash my couch, but you're doing this with both arms and you're just bringing the demo right up there, right to the side. Notice my elbow's not moving. It can be flexed a little bit, like my arm can be bent slightly here, but that angle doesn't change. I'm not extending it at the end or bending it at the end or the beginning. It stays the same. My elbow is facing out. My shoulder's being activated, the back of my shoulder. I'm coming right up like this. And you're gonna crush those rear delts really, really well. A lot of people don't have developed rear deltoids and it can inhibit their, mo their uh, just their general physical abilities and it can, it can even affect posture and all kinds of stuff. I mean, really all this stuff can, but rear deltoids I think is, is under, uh, under, underestimated and I think does bring real value. Um, and then I had some crunches for legs. We're gonna get through some quick leg stuff and then we'll get into the Q&A. So thank you guys for, for sitting through this and um, hopefully you're learning some stuff but we can talk more. So for legs basically, I had my mom starting off with some dumbbell squats. Um, squats can be done in so many different ways. You can hold dumbbells up by your shoulders. You can hold a barbell over your shoulders. You can hold a barbell in front of your shoulders, for front squats, all kinds of things you can do. For dumbbell back squats, basically what I did is I had my mom grab a pair of dumbbells, hold them by her side, and I'll try to get back here. So squats, what's key is you are trying to just kind of keep your posture really clean, keep that chest out. And as you're coming down, there's what we call kind of a triple flexion. So your, your ankles, your knees, and your hips are all bending. A lot of people, when they do squats, they do this kind of thing. And they just bend a lot more at the knees than anywhere else. And they don't really distribute the force effectively. And they, uh, they basically just, it's not good for your knees. And it doesn't activate your glutes and the other parts of your body and your core the way that you want to when you're really doing a squat for the right reasons. And so the key here is making sure your knees, when you're looking from a bird's eye view, your knees aren't going in front of your toes. So I know you can't see my toes, but I'm sure you can imagine where they are. They're right there. Your knees aren't going in front of your toes. So as your knees bend, your butt's coming back a little bit too. Your chest is staying up, your back's staying straight, you can come nice and low, and then pushing off the heels on the way up. For any kind of squat-based kind of motion, most leg stuff, you push off your heels. The second mistake people make is they come down and they push off their toes and they just don't do it right. All that force and weight should be on your heels. So with those, you can probably do heavier weight. You might be grabbing bigger dumbbells. If you can afford to get a little barbell, even a mini one, throw some weight on there and do 40 pounds, 60 pounds, whatever, great. That's totally fine. Okay. All right, these are super cool. These are called dumbbell. The next one is called a dumbbell Bulgarian a split squat. I don't know why it's called Bulgarian. I hope it's not like a not PC thing. I have no idea why it's called that. It's just been called that for years, and that's the only reason that I call it that. Another, uh, let's just call it a split squat because that's basically what it is. I don't know what Bulgaria has to do with that. So pardon my ignorance. Don't want to offend anybody. It just has been called that for a long time, and maybe you're, maybe not. That needs to change. I don't know. Anyways, we're going to do some split squats. Okay. 
Split squats. These are awesome. They are gonna hit your glutes really, really well. So what you're doing is you're grabbing a couple dumbbells. You have one foot in front and one foot elevated on a chair or bench. The same principles apply to the other squats. Your knee's not coming up here in front of your toes. You're not just bending all at your knee or just at your hips. You're coming down and shifting back a little bit and then pushing just off that one leg off the heel. All of it's off the heel. You're switching, you're doing both sides, but that one is a glute crusher. Super good for glutes. You're obviously gonna hit some quads and you're gonna hit some hamstrings on that too. Okay, next, I'm gonna grab a quick drink and then we'll go through our next one. It's hot here today. And if everybody's okay with it, we are happy to stay online and keep this webinar going to answer the questions as well. So just wanted to make note of that. Yeah, we are almost done here. I've literally just got a couple more movements. Um, walking lunges. So this, you don't have to necessarily walk and have like a designated amount of space where you can walk, you know, it's 40 feet wide or whatever along. Um, you can do this in, mo in, in, uh, in place. And so, you know, maybe you guys are familiar with lunges, but I think they're great. Also great for glutes. Um, great, great for, for quads and hamstrings too, but super effective. Um, and my glutes get pretty fried after some heavy lunges. I'll often grab weight and put it on my back, but you can also just as grab dumbbells and then the same kind of thing. You're taking a big step forward and coming down to about here. And the key with lunges, I'm gonna drop the way and just talk for a second. The key with these lunges is that I like to see three 90 degree angles. The first one is from my front foot and knee joint. The next one is from my knee through hips to my other knee. And the last one is from my hips, knee to other foot, okay? 90 degrees, uh, 90 degrees, and 90 degrees, okay? That's, that's really where you want. A lot of people do this. This is not a pretty lunge. You're on your toes, you're not distributing the force well, you're not hitting your glutes nearly enough, you're just not doing it right. So really, get that foot enough, you know, practice a couple times, get the motion out where you get your foot far enough in front of you, far or close enough in front of you to where you're getting a basically 90 degree, and then try when you're pushing up to get up from that lunge, you're not pushing too much off this back leg. You're really trying to distribute most of the force and exertion on getting up on the front heel. So you're coming up like this. So whether you're walking forward is fine, or you're just coming back like this and then, and then alternating and doing the other leg. Or you can walk forward. I walk forward if I'm at the gym because I've got the space for it. If I was gonna do it at home, I'd probably just do something like that. Um, the last one was basically like a hip extension. And so she had a little dumbbell Then I was basically, I'll show you, I had her kind of positioned like this. Again, back straight. Everything's nice and clean, your posture's good. I'm gonna tilt you guys down a little bit. And all you're doing here is putting, I'll just grab a little dumbbell. I, I just put the dumbbell kind of right in the back of my leg here. Many ways to do this, but basically your back straight, you're just kind of coming up like this and just trying to hit those glutes. You know, don't put your core into it, don't swing up like this, nothing funny. Really everything else is still, you're just moving at the hip joint and you're extending your hip joint. You're, you're pushing your knee, you're bringing your knee back opening up this joint, otherwise known as extending it. This is a flexing a joint, this is extending a joint. So we're just extending that joint. And just a good squeeze up top for a couple seconds and just alternate and do both legs. And then throw in the core, if you wanna do the core. Um, that's basically it for my split muscle group routine that pretty much anybody can do at home. If they have a couple dumbbells, a little bit of furniture, and a little bit of space. Um, and I think that can take you a long ways. And you can actually, you know, you might have to get heavier dumbbells or change your reps or this or that, but you can, you can definitely start, you know, getting well on your way to hitting some fitness goals with just a workout plan like that. Awesome. Thank you so much, Evan. Yeah, and no, it's my pleasure. Sorry it took a minute to get through all that, but I hope, I hope it all made sense. I hope you guys were able to follow me and everything. Yeah. I'm just going to go through the questions in order, but I know that a question from probably a lot of people is, will that, uh, that workout that you gave your mom, will that be available? Can I steal that and give that to the Yeah, I, was, I, was, I wanted to ask you guys after this if, um, 
if I could just send you a, uh, a written form of it, just so you can have it in reference. So you can put it on this. You guys can do whatever you want with it. You can put it wherever you want. But you can, uh, yeah, I would be happy to share it in a written out so you have it all available and visible easily. Perfect. So we'll go ahead and start going through some of the questions. Uh, they range from vet school questions to fitness to a little bit of everything else. So okay. uh, this is a fun one. Uh, what is the most memorable beach you have been to? Okay, uh, that's a good one. So over the, my years in traveling, one of my favorite kinds of places to be is a beach where there's lush jungle on one side of the, of the sand and a super tropical, gorgeous, coral reef ridden ocean on the other side. So I get my, my wildlife in on the land and in the sea. So, um, man, there's, there's been quite a few. I've been really lucky. So Southern Costa Rica um, is really gorgeous beach. It's some of that water you can't get into. There's a lot of bull sharks and stuff, so you have to be careful. Um, Man, Tiger Beach in the Bahamas, some of my favorite diving, diving with tiger sharks. But anyways, in Costa Rica, it's called Corcovado National Park. Uh, Indonesia, northern Sulawesi had one of my favorite beaches because it was really beautiful hiking there. I got to work with a really endangered uh, primate called the, the Celebes macaque or the black crested macaque. Um, and there's like 200 in the wild. I saw tarsiers in the same area, but then the diving there was just super stunning. So yeah that's that's my answer in short is like if, if there's good diving warm water tropical coral reefs sharks wildlife and then there's a jungle behind it oh it's all over the world you find the right places but that's 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 heaven to me that sounds really good right now now that it's hard to travel so yeah I know. <laughs> uh, so we have a current student any tips on maintaining a work-life balance a what student sorry just, uh, just a current student. So oh, current student. I'm sorry, I just didn't hear that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a challenge at times, you know, because you're going to go through your program and there are often several weeks or even months, you know, consecutively where you have a major exam or two every single week. And so unless you have photographic memory, chances are you're, you're just not going to have a great balance. And I just, I'm, I'm just going to be, I'm not going to lie to you. It's, there's going to be times where you don't have a good work-life balance. You, you're not getting social, you know, social as, as, you, as you want. You're not getting to talk or spend as much time with friends and family. You might not get to you know, get in the gym as much as you can. But you know, if you can somehow fit it into your routine and you just don't make any exceptions, you say from this time to this time, nobody's bothering me. I'm going to do what I need to do, whether that's a social thing or a fitness thing, or you just have to read or just decompress and watch TV you just kind of turn it into a priority and just make it so where it's just nothing interrupts it. Just not unless, you know, other than emergency, but like, you know, it's just part of your agenda and you just have to do it. But honestly, I, there were times in school where I didn't have a good work-life balance. It was, it was, for me, it was nearly impossible to maintain. Yeah. Thank you. And Sorry, okay. that's probably a downer answer, <laughs> but I don't want to lie to you guys. And this is an interesting question too. I, I don't know if, if you have a great answer for it or not, but um, do you feel a pet professional such as a groomer, trainer, pet massage therapist uh, would benefit more from a business degree or going into a medical degree? Wow. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm probably not the, the expert to answer. It's just guessing on what I know just from being in the profession as a practicing veterinarian, to be honest, I would say if your goal is a business perspective and you want to see more clients and make more money, then I think that you know, an animal health degree is not going to do you as much value as a business degree. So I would, I would say that. And if you're going to get some sort of animal, animal medical based degree, um, I don't think if, unless you're a technician, uh, obviously if you're a veterinarian, but unless you're doing something where you're handing animals and, and doing things that involve their medical health, I don't think that's something that you need to worry about. And to be honest, I've had groomers and, and professions like that give pet owners medical advice. Uh, and sometimes it's accurate and it's good. And I'm really glad they pointed out or, or bring it to the owner's attention to then bring to my attention. Other times it's not accurate. And, you know, for all you guys out there and pet owners, um, just if your groomer or someone tells you something, they might have experience. It might be, you know, worth investigating further with your vet, but just be, um, be careful in taking full on medical advice from them. And I'm not 
hating on groomers or anything like that. I'm thankful for groomers. And like, when you have a good groomer, it's awesome. That's a really nice thing to have, but just remember what their profession is. That's grooming dogs. Okay. Um, whereas, you know, if you're going to a vet practice or you don't, you know, you're talking about your animal's health, that's what their profession is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that's an excellent answer. And, um, this question is from a student they're mainly confused about uh, what they should pursue. They, their school offers both big and small animal studies. Sure. And so kind of just the confusion surrounding what they pursue after completing graduation. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I mean, I'm really lucky. I kind of knew what I wanted to be doing pretty early on in med school. I, I you know, considered, I thought a surgery res residency would be cool. I thought a zoo residency would be cool but I really knew pretty much what I wanted to be doing. So I didn't have to battle that as much. But for a lot of those people, if they really, you know, the vet field's a big one. Just because you go to vet school doesn't mean you're gonna go be a practicing vet. You can be a lab vet, you can work for a big company, you can, you can do wildlife rescue, you can do small animal rescue, you can do, I mean, there's so many different kind of ways you can be a veterinarian. That's what's so cool about this profession is it's not just going to a clinic and giving vaccines necessarily. If you wanna do that, great, that's a fun job too but there's so much variety. And so my best advice is explore as much of that as you can at this stage. I don't know how far you are in your, in your education, but if you have opportunities to do some things that you don't know as much about, but might pique your interest a little bit, whether it's large animal or, or um, you know, food production or wildlife or whatever, uh, immerse yourself in it a little bit and see if maybe it's something that excites you. Um, and then, you know, if, if you still don't know when you're graduating, you know, find something that you know you're comfortable with or you gravitate to at least to some degree, just so you can have a job and have something to fall back on while you're looking for other stuff and just seeing whether it's seeing patients or whatever it is. But it's, it's nice to start paying off that school debt because once you're out of school, a lot of those loans, um, that's when they start accruing interest. And I, maybe that's changed a little bit now than 10 years ago, but you know, try to find something you're comfortable with at least. And then, you know, talk to your colleagues, talk to your classmates, see what they're up to and the different kinds of uh, fields of that medicine and see what they like or don't like. And, and you know, just get some insight from them on what, what it's like to be a, you know, day of life, uh, you know, a day in the life of uh, being a vet in their shoes. Mm -hmm. So this person is currently working on their prereqs to apply for vet school and they are training at the gym five times a week. All right with macro dieting, um, but worried that they won't be able to sustain that when they get into school. So how would you recommend maintaining a workout schedule and diet plan all while studying in vet school? Right. Uh, and there were times that was challenging for me too, but I, uh, it's, we talked a little bit about this earlier. It's prioritizing that non-negotiable time. Mm -hmm. And once you have that set, that helped me a lot. So for example, when I was in school, the first two years are mostly on main campus. Uh, the, 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 the university's gym is also on main campus. So on lunch breaks, we would have a little over an hour. I would speed walk to the gym, get a nice, effective, busy, you know, 45 train, minute training session in, um, and then cruise back to class. I mean, I'm lucky I don't get super gross when I weight train. I might sweat a little bit, but I don't come back, you know, being, you know, super unpleasant, I guess. So if you have to shower, that would be a tough, a tough thing for you. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that, that I think just committing to that's super important. And then when it comes to your diet, the most effective thing you can do for not only staying on that diet, but also I think it's very financially practical and affordable is meal prepping. This is probably something you already do or have considered doing if you're not already, uh, but meal prepping goes a long way. Just put the time in on those Sundays or whatever day of the week you want and just have your week ready. Everything's good to go. So when you are jammed and you got to study or you got to run or you're going to class or whatever it is, you got meals sitting right there. You put them, I had a big cooler. I'll, I'll show you guys actually my vet school cooler just because I think they'll think it's funny. <laughs> I still use it and love it. And it's huge. But this thing came with me everywhere I went in vet school. This was all, and I still use it for my work. And it could fit several meals and drinks and everything in my water bottle and everything I needed. And it really helps keep my diet the way it wanted to be. And uh, from, a, from a macro or from you know, that perspective of what kind of food I wanted to be eating, 
to uh, also being really financially practical. I didn't have to buy meals and lunches and BS all the time and eat junk food all the time. I just had my meals ready. So the meal prepping, I think this, this, this goes for anybody dieting. Meal prepping is so necessary because stuff comes up in life and you got to run. And if you don't eat a meal, you're going you're gonna to feel crummy. And so it should never be an excuse that, oh, you know, I had to cheat. I had to get, you know, some fast food or I had to get this, you know, stop at the gas station and buy a couple, you know, candy bars or whatever. Like that shouldn't happen. You should be meal prepping and be prepared for those moments because they will happen. There's just, it's just going to happen. And so don't let that be a bind for you. Don't let that be an issue. Always have something available where you don't have to cheat and eat crap you don't want to eat. Yeah. And I'm assuming this was more a question for a uh, pre pandemic, but um, how do you divide your time between clinic hours and exotic trips or trips to reservations or rescues? Um, I know obviously with the pandemic, that's probably likely not happening, but before all of this, right. um, how do you divide that time? Yeah, I mean, so when I gr first graduated vet school, I mean, like I said earlier, I did that three month trip that I wanted to do if it was like a graduation, like celebration, like just get out and see some super exotic places. I went, I went to Vietnam actually shortly after that, the Indonesia trip. But anyways, um, I would uh, actually literally just save the money and save vacation days. Um, and even I would get a lot of it was non paid, you know, I just I would just set time aside and save just enough money to go somewhere. I mean, luckily, those places I went and still to this day, for the most part, our currency in the US at least is usually um, favorable to a lot of the places I would go to, whether it was, was Southeast Asia or Central America or a lot of places in Africa, you know, and the most expensive thing was just getting there, which is the international ticket to get there. And then once, once, once I was there, you know, it was, you can travel on a budget in a lot of these places. It's not the prettiest thing, but you will get immersed in the culture when you take gnarly bus rides, eat a lot of street food, um, stay in kind of, you know, not the most beautiful hostels and that kind of thing. It's totally doable. And so that's how I would do that my first couple of years out when I was, you know, I had a lot of debt and, you know, as an associate general practitioner, you know, it's not a super high paying job. You know, I work at a nice hospital. I love it. And it's, I'm not saying it's, it's any worse there. It's, it's great there. There's potential there, but you know, you're not making crazy money. These days is different. And so I've got different projects. I had a TV show on Animal Planet, for example, where I was pretty much MIA from the US for just about three months straight. I come home for 36 hours at a time between filming a couple episodes, but every episode is in a foreign country. And so I was gone a lot. There's other opportunities come up and I just make time and, you know, I'm part time at the hospital now because of the other things that I do because of my other trips and my other traveling and my other projects. And I'm, you know, I'm working on a book and I'm launching that in a couple months. And I've, I've got a Facebook TV show that I'm doing right now and um, other, you know, companies and brands and things that I want to work with. So I, my profession as a veterinarian has evolved or has changed uh, from being a super full-time, super busy associate at a vet hospital. So it's different now. And here we have another, uh, fitness question. So uh, this person is 65 and has a weight loss as a goal. Um, do, awesome. you have, do you have a recommendation for a slow and steady program to start? Um, she mentioned that she has bad knees and back due to obviously lifting animals and just being in the profession for many oh, years. Wow. Right on. Um, I mean, honestly, a modified version of what we did, I think could still be appropriate depending on what your injuries and limitations are. If you are able to even just do lighter weight and go through some of these dumbbell motions and be a little bit more supportive, maybe instead of doing standing dumbbell curls or standing, you know, overhead shoulder presses, you're doing the sitting version like I was demonstrating for the sake of screen space uh, on, our, on our little session this afternoon. And even for squats, a lot of people can still even do body weight squats unless your knees are really thrashed and they could be, so, you know, different animal professions can bust up your shoulders, your knees, your elbows, all kinds of joints. Um, but unless they, unless you can't do some of the basics, body weight goes a super long way. A huge part of weight loss goals, just as much as fitness is diet. And so, you know, for people that are limited on their physical, uh, abilities or how much they can exert themselves or the movements or motions they can do, it's that much more important for you to, um, you know, put that effort into eating the appropriate diet and being intelligent about that. Yeah. Perfect. We still have about 10 questions. So yeah. um, if you're open to that, I will continue. That's fine. Yeah, we can keep zipping through. Awesome. So this person finds themselves 
um, in areas that are ramp rampant with rattlesnakes. This is an avid hiker. So hello, Henry. And what, what would you suggest if you're hiking and accidentally have an encounter with a snake uh, without access to a hospital within a reasonable distance? So best course of action. Do you try to remove the venom? If so, how? So more of a bit by a rattlesnake question. Right, right. Um, I mean, there's different schools of thought, but when it comes to specifically rattlesnakes and uh, rattlesnake, I mean, most people say, according to the research, trying to suck out venom doesn't do anything, but then other, you know, venom people will say uh, it can help. And so, you know, there's like bee sting kits that like are suction kind of thing that's then uh, they use suction on your skin. Like you shave the little patch if you have any, any hair there or anything, you apply this little suction cup and then maybe that can suck out some venom, but uh, whether or not it's gonna help much, I'd focus more of your time in just getting to the hospital ASAP. With, with, um, with rattlesnake venom, you actually don't wanna do a whole lot to the bite wound. I'm pretty sure, I might be mixing this up, but with like, with the lapids, which are neurotoxic venomous snakes like cobras, crates, mambas, not, you know, we have coral snakes in the US, but there's, it's very rare to get bit by a coral snake. They're so elusive and they're just not aggressive at all. And not that these other snakes aren't aggressive, but they're just, they just, you know, you can, they rarely bite people. Um, so with those guys, you actually do want to apply a little bit of pressure to that area. But with the rattlesnake bites, because swelling's involved, you don't want to screw around with blood supply too much. So you actually, you, you kind of just want to leave it as is and get the, the best thing you can do is get anti-venom as soon as possible. And so, no, if you are going somewhere and you worry about rattlesnakes, ghosts, you know, be aware. Henry, that needs to end immediately. It's so loud next to my ear. Um, you need to know our hospitals. But honestly, here's the thing I got to tell you, though. When it comes to rattlesnakes and that kind of thing, um, you know, if you leave them alone, they'll leave you alone. Like, and this goes for any venomous snake. I've heard all these crazy stories, but honestly, I don't believe one where the snake just goes and, you know, outright offensively uh, attacks somebody. You know, the only time people get bit is when a snake is provoked, okay? And so that means people are messing with them or they accidentally step on them, which is not the person's fault, or they step into a shoe or something that has a snake or a garden bed they're reaching into, they don't realize the snake's there. But, in, you know, really, it's funny, and with rattlesnakes too, they're ne like, if you give them respect and space, they don't want anything to do with you any more than you want to do with them if you're afraid of snakes. So honestly, just, you know, look where you're, watch where you're walking, if you are on paths where there's good sun, there might be snakes there, but just keep your eyes about you. And it's pretty rare for people that don't want to uh, you know, encounter snakes to get bit. Most snake bites, especially rattlesnakes in the US, I think it's like 90 or 95% of them are like young males under the influence of alcohol that are you know, putting themselves in a situation where they might get bit by a rattlesnake. If that's not you, the odds of that happening are pretty slim. Yeah. So here's another fitness one. Um, what, what workout would you say is most similar to a push-up if a person is not able to do push-ups due to an injury? Um, I mean, so like what's something we were doing or could do is a dumbbell chest press. Okay. If, if you want to get that motion, but have a lower resistance, you can do lightweight dumbbells and just like a bench press, you know, like dumbbell bench or, 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 or chest press. You're literally just same kind of thing. You're leaning back. You're just kind of pressing up the dumbbells this way. So you don't have your whole body weight on your shoulders. It's very lightweight. You're lying back. You can do just your hands. You can do five pound dumbbells. You can just kind of get that range of, excuse me, that range of motion um, with very, very low resistance, but still activate your pectorality, you know, your, your pec muscles and, and hit the same, you know, part of your shoulders and everything that you would, that you would be hitting with, with a bench press. Mm -hmm. or, or I'm sorry, with a push up. Sorry, with a push up. Yep. Sounds great. Thank you. And will working the back, will working back exercise help with lessening back spasms using bands to start? So basically if, if she's in a spasm, should she not do anything or will movement, like the exercise itself help relieve it in the moment? In the moment, I found that stretching to be effective and reducing like spasming and that, I mean, I've never had really intense bad muscle spasms. I'm not uh, totally professional in this regard. So I can't, I can't give you like super, you know, 
hundred percent accurate professional advice here, but I, mean, I found stretching to be effective. And honestly, if back spasming is something that you do suffer from on a regular basis, I would highly encourage you to um, start, you know, consider doing yoga, you know, or some other kind of stretching, but yoga has been so effective for so many people with back issues and, and joint issues um, that I think that could bring you a lot of value and help reduce the spasms and just, you know, helping day to day when you do have spasms. Yeah, I would completely agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> and this is kind of a two part question. Um, what is your opinion on the value or necessity of taking protein supplements, like uh, the grocery store sold protein supplements? Like and, protein powder or something like that? Yeah, that's what it sounds like. We'll start okay. with that question. That's the question. What is my opinion on it? Yeah. Necessity? Uh, mm -hmm. It's not necessary. You don't have to. I mean, a lot of competitive bodybuilders, for example, a lot of them drop protein shakes when they're getting ready to go do a show where they're going to compete on stage because of the calorie. You know, they don't want the super simple, quick digesting proteins. They don't want to risk anything turning into fat or whatever. So, um, and just honestly, from from that's that's getting into another weird subject. But like, no, you don't have to do it. I mean, I think the nutrient and nutrient timing is super important. Like when you eat certain macronutrients is every bit as important as what macronutrients you eat. So, for example, after you weight train, if you're trying to put on some muscle, especially, then that's actually the best time to have some simple carbohydrates like your pasta or whatever, your rice or whatever, your fruit, whatever carbs you're going to have that day. Um, maybe a little bit before you train and then afterwards because your muscles need energy. It also spikes your insulin a little bit. Insulin makes you more anabolic. It delivers nutrients to the muscles way more effectively. Um, and so when you eat those kind of things is important. And uh, as with, pro with uh, carbohydrates, same with protein, like you want to have some protein after you lift. So I would eat something, whatever you eat after you exercise, try to, and, and you want to get protein absorption, try to minimize fats whether it's unsaturated or saturated fat, doesn't matter what kind of fat it is, avocado, pork fat, whatever fat you might be eating, egg yolk, just minimize it. And so having clean uh, or lean forms of proteins, whether they're, you know, whatever kind of protein it is, just make sure it's a complete protein. If you're combining two things like, um, like you know, brown rice uh, with like rice and beans, that creates a complete protein where both things have protein individually, but they don't have enough of the adequate of the of the necessary proteins to actually build muscle so um nuts and wheat bread like peanut butter and jelly kind of thing that's another thing you could do um you know don't go crazy on the peanut butter it's got some fat in there but like yeah if you can do something that's low fat there's and whatever protein option you're comfortable eating uh that's great and that's totally you will see results and grow and whatever you want and you don't have to get whey protein or buy you know protein powder awesome and I, I like protein powder. I use it. I find it convenient. I don't use it every time I train, but I, I don't have any, I'm not against it by any means. I think it's a nice option to have, but you don't need it. And did you have any specific recommendations for bands? So I know you didn't have any at your home at this moment, mm -hmm. a specific brand or weight. Uh, my best advice is to get, I mean, a lot of them come in kits where you can get like, they come with maybe two or three or four and they have some different resistance levels, maybe more, um, get something like that that just looks durable. And I've had different bands over the years and trained with different bands and trained other people with different brands. I don't have, I don't have any one that is coming to mind that I'm really keen on over others. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, just get something that has, you know, a couple different options to start because as you get comfortable with the motion, you might see yourself progressing pretty quickly. And, and you also, when you get them, you might think you're stronger than you are. And then once you get those bands going, and that tension's really high when the band is the most stretched out. Um, it's you know it, it might you might want something lighter to have around. I've made that mistake personally before where I got way too thick of bands and ropes, and I'm trying to do these big range of motion movements where I'm getting the band so stretched out. And I'm like, oh, I can't even do this. Like I got to get lower, like skinnier bands. Yeah. We just have a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. So uh, from a current Purdue vet student. Um, do you have any suggestions for improving communication skills to be effective when speaking with clients? Um, have you ever attended any good workshops or conferences for tips on working with people with different personalities? Yeah, um, I've never attended a conference or workshop for that. When I was at CSU, we actually had a uh, part of a course 
was about client communication. They actually filmed, they had, they hired professional actors to come in to be some of the classic difficult clients. And they, um, they had us do a mock, you know, uh, appointment, you know, when we were in school and we hadn't done any real appointments as vets anyway. So we go in there and we had to go deal with these actors and they were just like super difficult in their own special ways, as many people are difficult in their own special ways. Um, and then we did like a review of it and that kind of thing. So that's really in terms of training for it or learning more about it in, in specifically in the vet world, that was really it. But honestly, if you do have experience working outside of being a veterinarian, that goes a long way. So when I was, a, I, I think being a personal trainer, I learned as much about people skills and acquiring new clients and, 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 and everything is, is anything else. Because when you're a vet, at the, at the end of the day, a lot of people look as if you're trying to sell them something. And you could even look at it that way too. And listen, I don't, I don't offer anything that I don't think is in your pet's best interest and, and, and taking into account your financial um, uh, abilities or whatnot for you know, what you want to do for your patient. I'm not one of those vets that just throws the whole everything at them. And I don't try to be super conservative where we do nothing. I really try to tailor to the person. And I think that's one of the, that's a tip in itself tailor to that person because some people can or are willing to do a lot more than others. And so you have to devise your medicine that way. And so if somebody's like, they really need like a few different things and you need to kind of stepwise focus, you need to prioritize that one thing and then explain to them exactly that and tell them this is the most important because we need to rule this in or out now. Like we need to know, or this treatment, I think, we could try this. And I think there's a good chance it's going to help. I don't know. We don't have any diagnostics to prove it. But in my experience, what I've seen, whatever, blah, 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 this is going to be actually cheaper than diagnostics as treatments often are, as you guys may or may not know. Um, and so accommodating to those kinds of people. But yeah, what I'm getting at, I'm sorry, I'm kind of everywhere. You, you're, you know, you're, you have to convince these people of why. So if you can, you know, having a good grasp on the subject matter and being able to put it into simple terms, I think is a really good strength. And I'm very lucky that's something I'm, I'm good at naturally. I also learned a lot how to do that as a trainer because I know a lot about anatomy and, and muscle attachments and insertions and movements, but I can also explain it in a way that makes sense to people that know nothing about it. And so if you can do that, that goes a super long way. And, um, and just trying to accommodate to each individual person. But really, that's, that's something you don't learn so much in vet school. You know, it's, it's your people skills. And some people are just better than others. And for you guys in vet school or, or then are veterinarians already, um, you know, a lot of vet people aren't great people people. You know, like they, I think, go to vet school thinking, I'm not a big per people person. I love animals. I'm, I want to be a vet. And they don't realize if you are going to be a practicing clinical veterinarian, your people skills have to be every bit as good as your pet skills and, and, and animal skills because you're working with people's babies every day, multiple times a day. So um, I don't know, I hope that helps, but that's, those are some things that have been helpful for me and, and, and worth keeping in mind when you are, if you are pursuing clinical practice. Mm -hmm. And this will be the final question that we'll answer today. So um, when you reach out to different wildlife organizations uh, mm -hmm. surrounding the world, how do you know if they're reputable? Yeah, um, super valid question, super important. And there's so many that are, uh, I'm not super keen on. So um, when it came to me personally doing this and reaching out to like say wildlife rescues, generally wildlife rescues, some are more effective than others, but generally their heart's in the right place. Like they're not just in it for the money because in fact, usually they're struggling. Um, and they really do love the animals or that native wildlife to whatever region or country, you know, that they're in. Um, so I, I think, you know, you're not going to end up going to like a super terrible place. I, I've not been to a wildlife rescue that I've been like, man, those people are pieces of shit and they need to get out of business. That's, I, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's pretty uncommon. Uh, when it comes to wildlife, like charities and, and places to donate, um, it's tough. I mean, Charity Navigator is pretty helpful. You can get a lot of financial information on a company and see uh, how and what they do with their money and how much it actually goes towards the animals versus salaries or promoting or PR or whatever it is. Um, and I'm honestly, I'm super lucky that I've been able to see a lot of these places, you know, that do work in the wildlife or conservation or whatever world um, firsthand. And so I've seen firsthand. I know 
that my effort's going in the right place. I know if I tell people to donate here, the money is going straight to the animals that need it. And it's not some big Instagram platform that hires celebrities and influencers and don't know a damn thing about wildlife conservation and has them come out on their trips that aren't really doing anything significant towards conservation. They're taking in so much money from people because they have so much better outreach and business skills than the people on the ground in the trenches actually doing the real work that the animals need and where the money really should be going. And so it's a really tough world to navigate out there. And it's a huge problem because so much good money from people with good hearts that want to help animals are giving it to places that really, I don't think are doing the right thing with it. And in a way are kind of taking it from the money that the animals that really need it. So I'm actually very bothered by places like that. Um, so, I mean, listen, if there's a species that is one that I've worked with, and I've said, hey, this organization does awesome work. Like if I worked with the you know, Kangaroo Island Wildlife, or Wildlife Park or Rhino 911 or the Wiro Primate Rehab Center, you know, or uh, many more where that came from. If you're seeing me work with them, there is no doubt it, you know, that the, their money is going exactly where we all want it to go. I, if, if I promote their work, that means I super believe in them and I know it's going to the right place. But it's a tough world to navigate. And another thing to look into is seeing what work they're really doing and seeing like, uh, you know, where are they helping? How are they helping? You know, what is the conservation of these animals in the big picture? How are they helping on their level? Not that it has to be big, but it's, I don't know, there's not a right answer for it. I feel like I'm just babbling because honestly, it's almost impossible. Even me, who has so much experience with working with different conservationists around the world, I still have to, I, it's not easy for me to just look a place up and decide whether or not I think they're legit or not legit or whatever degree of legitness that they might be. It's not easy. And so maybe, honestly, it's just, you know, looking and seeing what organizations or people that you trust, um, hopefully you trust me. I'm very honest and I really do prioritize the animals over anything else that I do and don't do anything that's not in the interest of an individual animal or wildlife or habitat in general. I don't post or do things that compromise that ever. And so if you trust me or other uh, people in the profession or influencers or whatever that are, know what they're talking about, then I, I would maybe go off that because that's where I've learned a lot of my stuff is reaching out to other people in different fields and saying, and feeling out, you know, hey, like, do you know this organization? Are they cool? Like they reach out to me or I wanna see what they do. That goes a long way. Not that you'll necessarily be able to contact these people, but if you see it on their brands or their social or whatever it is, that should give some indication. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for staying on uh, uh, way longer than we had actually uh, scheduled. But thank everyone, thank everybody else for attending today also. Uh, this was the first webinar in our series of fun webinars we are producing now on a monthly basis. In order to attend or watch the recordings of future fun webinars like this, you'll need to be a Fear Free member. Interested in learning more about membership or how to get Fear Free certified? Contact us at wags at fearfreepets.com. We hope you enjoyed today's webinar on at-home fitness with Dr. Evan Anton. And if you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact us. Stay well, everyone.